All right, so uh, welcome. Uh, my name is Tom Jacobs. I'm an evolutionary astrologer, also an energy worker and a channel. And uh, this uh, presentation is called Changing Karma. Now, um, what I learned from different religious teachings and also from people talking about karma in astrology uh, is essentially that you can't really change it. And I've just had a lot of experiences. I'm gonna I'm not going to summarize the experiences, but I'm going to summarize what I've learned through a bunch of experiences where uh, – it turns out you can actually change karma. So part of my inspiration for doing this is to inspire you to come out of old ways of thinking about what karma is and uh, you know, drink this in if it makes sense to you, chew on it if some of it doesn't make sense, be in touch later with questions. I mean, we're gonna, we're gonna do a Q&A uh, at the end as well, we'll have time. Um, but this is may, might be new for some of you. I think for a lot of you, it will, intuitively in your gut it will make sense uh because we'll, we'll we'll see what's going on here but but um yeah i didn't learn this from people I, I this is something i did channel quite a lot of from the ascended master i work with basically when i was complaining about things in my life that i thought were karmic and he was like well you should change it and i was like what are you talking about so this whole learning started so um great so let's get started so the plan today number one I'm going to just do an overview, just to spell some things out, of what we've been taught about karma and why what we've been taught doesn't work. Uh, number two, my unique take on it. And then number three, we're going to talk about the astrology of this, uh, four kinds of karma and how to change it. You know, kind of a four-step process, a four-step story of telling a karmic story in a chart. Pluto, uh, south node, south node ruler, north node. I'll get into my overview of how I treat all four of those things. Um, uh, last month you heard the Pluto in the houses. I did the Pluto intro, you know, an intro on Pluto. So you might have an idea of that. We'll get into the other things here too. Um, okay, great. Let's start with what we've been taught. We've been taught you can't change karma. Uh, or you can change some of it, but not the hard stuff. Um, in the, um, Vedic tradition, uh, in Jyotish and Indian astrology, often called Vedic astrology, uh, you'll find it broken down from the ancient teachings uh, from that from the the system that uh, there are four kinds of karma. The first three you can alter through remediation, through mantras, through whatever like these different things, gemstones, the different remedies that 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 um, uh, system recommends. But the fourth one. Mm, can change it. And that never really sat right with me. Um, when I started studying evolutionary stuff in the early 2000s, I also was reading about that system too. And I was, because I wasn't sure where I might land. But so we're taught you can't really change it. You can't escape it either. It's inevitable. Uh, this phrase, what goes around comes around. I heard that, I don't know, 7 billion times in my childhood. My mom used to say that all the time. Um, and then we really think of it as a system of reward and punishment. So we're going to break this down. If you're good, we seem to believe, you'll receive good. If you're bad, you'll receive bad. If you're receiving bad right now, you must be bad. Or you must have been bad in the past. Same thing with if you're receiving good stuff now, you must be good or have been good in the past. I put this in here in this really pedantic way to make it obvious how ridiculous this idea is. Okay, good. Well, anyway, so I, I know it's, it's, it's just so simplistic when you spell it out like this. Oh, well, if bad things are happening, well, then you must be bad. Okay, now these are the, the system of reward and punishment. These are from religious teachings that attempt to explain pain, suffering, grief, all the difficult parts of life, violence, uh, tragedy, natural disasters, all kinds of things. When the crops, when the crop fails a certain year, or when the drought comes, you know, all these things, we we believe there's these rewards and punishments. Well, obviously, bad treatment follows bad behavior, right? This is how humans treat each other. So why wouldn't God treat us that way? So these are modeled after human conceptions of justice. You have to pay for wrongdoing. You, you drive your car into your neighbor's yard, it damages a tree in the side of the house, you have to pay for it. You know, there's this whole legal structure in, in societies all over the world 
for this kind of retribution or justice or something like that. So our human conception of justice includes that there's a very clear um, you know, line where you've done something wrong according to the social contract or the laws on the books. But arg, <laughs> why do good things keep happening to bad people? If you think about reward and punishment, why do, bad, why do good things keep happening to bad people? I, I usually joke about this because I go straight into, well, why do you think bad things happen to you? Because you're a good person. That's where this reward and punishment model of karma gets messed up. And where it doesn't work is, well, okay, now I'll tell you how the soul sees it, and then we'll get into that. From what I can tell in my model of soul, and I, I introduced this a little in last month's uh, teaching on Pluto in the Houses, because I had to talk about what soul is. So from what I can tell, a soul is a part of source, a portion of source or divine consciousness or God and goddess consciousness. Oops, sorry. So a soul lives human lives to learn what it means to do so. Since being all that is or goddess energy as a whole teaches it nothing because it knows everything. And it's curious. It wants to know what it is like. So each soul outside time watches its human lives as works in progress, learning as they go. And there's no reward and there's no punishment. Okay. So there is no divine authority outside the soul itself, which is source. And you are hardlined consciousness-wise up to soul. So each soul is its final authority its own final authority, you are your own final authority. So what souls do together and for each other or to each other as humans is provide each other experiences to learn. Remember, all that is as a big blob cannot learn about itself because it knows everything. It's omnipotent. So we break off in these little portions and incarnate as humans seemingly separate from source and we're bouncing off each other and I'm lying to you and you're stealing my sandwich and I'm, you know, whatever. We're like, we're like having these experiences. And at some point we start believing, oh, well, if this painful thing's happening to me, then I must be bad. Okay. Okay. Now the soul intends that the humans learn the ups and downs and the ins and outs of all possible human experiences. That's why we're here. So pain and suffering are part of the process. They are entirely natural. Okay, now pain is not punishment. This is what we have to learn. We need to evolve beyond this assumption. Most of us are living out our beliefs about pain, suffering, misery, why they happen, tragedy, trying to figure out why we're being punished or conversely why we're not being rewarded for being good people. Or we're trying to have faith in a deity that has a plan for suffering, like there's a point, but often we still can't help but take it personally. There are times in our lives when things pile up. You know, it could be three miseries in a row or two sufferings plus two miseries and three pains. <laughs> you know, you can have a little laundry list, a little grocery list of, of difficult things that are happening can pile up. Um, it, it, it looks after a while like something's happening to you. And that's normal for the way our minds work to assume that at some point. How many people do you know expect to be punished or think that they deserve to feel shame or have to be ashamed? This is, this is a global problem, people. Okay. I know a lot of them, but I also know I attract clients and students who are looking to you know, raise the level of dialogue for themselves, but, but I see it everywhere. I see this all the time. I, I talk about this all the time for, for a moment in classes where I'm in the grocery store and I'm waiting and like, like there's always somebody where I'm going to go and I'm waiting. I'm like 20 feet away, 10 feet away. And I'm literally minding my own business. I pull my energy in. Somebody somehow senses me, turns around, sees me, jumps and scutter and scutters off and apologizes like energetically or literally. And I want to say to them as they're running away, stop apologizing for your existence. Like there's nothing wrong with you. But anyway, people, you know, these pilings up of different experiences in many lifetimes that are painful or grief related or whatever, or things we might judge ourselves for, 
for behaving badly, um, whether to ourselves or others, these things add up over time and can have some people expecting that they should be ashamed or something or should, should apologize for themselves. Okay, now my definition of karma is that it, it is belief or karmas are beliefs, one way or the other, wrapped around emotion. This is, this is central to everything I do. Something happens that hurts you or is fantastic and makes you happy, and you make a decision about what it means, why it happened, why it happened to you, why it happened when it happened. In other words, you develop beliefs about what something means. Now, if it's part of your soul's intended journey, for your human learning in many lifetimes, it will happen again and again. Like, uh, like I was thinking about this, um, my girlfriend and I were talking about um, this past relationship of mine where I happened to find this photo, and I have very few photos of this, this, uh, this woman and myself together. And, um, but she's a part of my life. And I, and I showed the picture to my girlfriend and she said, oh, yeah, yeah, she's a part of your life. And I was like, yeah, it's hard because at the end of the relationship, she, had to, she said, I can't ever talk to you again. And that was so painful. I have Pluto and Libra. That's just one of the things like deep pain, Pluto, can be in rejection or the ends of relationships or losing people, kind of Libra processes. And I realized, yeah, yeah, there's like that is going to keep happening in some way for me or around me. But it's my belief about what it means that is the karma, that is the problem. Okay. Uh, similarly, similarly, if you have Pluto and Virgo, you might be trying to help someone who won't receive it. It's in your bones, the motivation to be helpful, but somebody just doesn't care and doesn't want it. Well, what do you think it means about life, you, the world, that person, whatever, how well you're doing the thing? You know, it's all about your beliefs about it. Now, over time, you develop stronger beliefs about why. Like I said, it will repeat. Like, I will have relationship issues, Pluto and Libra. I'm learning to create fairness and harmony together. Sometimes it doesn't work. Um, the more that patterns occur or instances of patterns happen, my beliefs will get reinforced. The more entrenched it is, the deeper the karma. You can think, you know, if something happens and you're like, yeah, you know, stuff happens, and you don't get attached to it or stuck in it, it just happens and it moves on. If you start believing something about it, you vibrate more, it'll happen more. I'll get into that in a second. And then you believe more strongly because it keeps coming. You're like, I was right the whole time. Okay. So you hold a belief about why something happens and most of them are unconscious. Beliefs, like all thoughts, intentions, emotions, and attitudes, they vibrate signals to the outer world. Now, you might have an unconscious belief that says being betrayed hurts. It's a memory for many lifetimes. Remember, um, emotion wrapped around with belief. They're wrapped around together. Being betrayed hurts. I don't like myself when I hurt others. I keep hurting others. Why am I doing that? No one's there for me. No one listens to me. My needs don't matter, whatever it is. Or I'm not loved. I'm not lovable. I'm not supported. I'm not worth encouragement or celebration. Okay. Now, situations and other people manifest in front of you to show you that belief. Now, you see it as happening to you. If you have a thing about people won't listen to you, people will show up to not listen to you. And then you'll say, oh, again, people aren't listening to me. Look at what's happening to me. And it will hurt. The belief is tied with emotion. So it, what you're vibrating walks up to you. But the belief is wrapped around emotion, so you are taken over by that emotion. And remember, it's from most of them are from the unconscious, things you may not be aware of, which is why evolutionary astrology is such an incredibly powerful tool. So we can put words to, oh, yeah, your Pluto's in the second house, blah, blah, blah. Oh, your Pluto's in Leo in the second house, square, sun, and Scorpio in the 12th. Oh, here's a setup that you will manifest. Here's what you believe about it. And here's how you can change your mind, which we'll get to later. But the belief is wrapped around emotion. And this shift happens where the emotion gets triggered 
and suddenly you're repeating the belief. Oh yeah, people who wear blue shirts are all liars. Or I can't trust anybody. You know, and then suddenly you're not yourself. You're, you're so to speak temporarily taken over by that emotion and maybe the other life persona, the past life persona, who carries it, who had experiences with people in blue shirts who were liars or whatever. Then <laughs> you make crummy decisions from an off-kilter emotional place or from within the pain that is now taken over. And then you feel crummy about yourself because you made crummy decisions. Uh, and your brain tells you, you know, insert that disempowering thing again here. Oh, it was always true. No one ever listens or everyone lies or whatever it is. Uh, you can't trust men. You can't trust women. Like, you know, depending on who you're talking to, right? We hear these things. Okay. Now, then you go back to your life and you can't figure out why you kept and keep messing up because now you're yourself again. The frustration, the, the anger, the self-judgment, the sad, sadness seems to have abated somewhat. And now you're like, why did I make those crummy decisions? And who, you know, you don't realize you were taken over. So since you've been told that bad experiences are punishments for bad choices and behaviors, you assume you deserve it. Now I'm talking to smart people here or who are adults, but think about anytime, you know, people here in this EA community, we're, we're in here together. Think about when you talk to people, whether other, other kinds of astrologers or just people in the world, <laughs> uh, civilians, when you say, oh, yeah, I do um, blah, 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 you, sometimes I say karmic astrology instead of evolutionary astrology because I want them to understand it's a multi-life thing or a reincarnational approach. And people assume things about karma. They assume that they deserve the bad things that have happened to them. So um, this is a prevalent thing. Okay, now present conceptions of karma that we're working with from these religious perspectives lead you to shaming, hating, resenting, belittling yourself and keeping yourself from self-validation, self-care, self-trust, self-respect. Okay, all right. So changing karma. We have to change our relationship to emotions. In general, the existence of them and the fact that we feel what we feel and that everything we feel is actually part of the human experience. But then your particular triggers one by one. And again, that's where EA is so incredibly powerful. It's work, but you can change your conception of what things mean. And I want to give you um, at least one brief example for my experience. Uh, when I would learn, was learning this from the Ascended Master, basically kind of connected to him in my head and, when I'm thinking about things, sometimes I'm having a dialogue with him, and this was going on at this time. And I, I was um, looking at how many accidents I have had in my life with vehicles, with cooking in the kitchen, all kinds of things, and crossing the street and people seeming to not see me and almost hitting me. I used to live in LA and have to park uh, several blocks from my house, uh, and it happened, uh, I don't know. I always exaggerate when I say this. I want to say it happened two or three times a month which is a lot for years. Maybe it was a little more often, but part of me wants to say it happens every other day or whatever. But, but, um, and I was talking about this uh, once I lived in Tucson and was, was um, really kind of learning more about karma and how to work with this stuff. And he said, well, you believe you're not safe. And I said, really? And he said, yeah, you, these, are these things are happening only because you feel unsafe in your body. You believe you're not safe. And he was pointing out to me, my Mars Uranus in the first house square of the nodes, which just as a shorthand, you're trying to figure out what to do with change, physicality, violence, sexuality, but sometimes sudden things can happen. You know, I might, I might have a volcano of anger on Tuesday and they'll be fine on Wednesday. You know, there's a lot of energy movement. And if I don't use the energy, it might come at me. So accident prone was part of the story. And he said, decide every day that you're safe and everything's fine. And it stopped when I did. So that external thing that defined much of my life, I thought the universe hated me. I thought God hated me. I'm almost embarrassed to admit that, but that's what kept happening in my head because it kept happening over and over again of all kinds. So you have to change your relationship to the emotion and change the belief. That's how you do, you have to do both. Okay. 
Uh, now, let me just say one more thing. Everything I've gotten into here and what we'll, what we'll continue with in the presentation is a huge topic. And every single person's unique profile is her own, right? It's every profile is unique. Now, we, we know people with Pluto on the first have certain things in common. People with Pluto and Leo have certain things in common. You know, south node in the sixth square, Saturn in the ninth. They have something in common. But to really give justice, deeply into it. And like I said, it is work. And you have to go through the emotional triggers and process and change them. I do specialize in this. Um, if you're interested, you know, I do co ongoing coaching work, which includes energy work and also, you know, the, the channeling and the astrology together, because you have to go deeply into it to really change these things because they're locked in our fields, most of them as traumas or as chronic stresses or something. But anyway, I just want to point out, I'm doing this quick hour overview for you, but it's for every individual, it is a huge topic. Okay, now karma in the birth chart, four major categories that we're going to cover. Pluto, which is related to the most intense and difficult parts of life, phobias, fears, regrets, guilt, shame, you know, feeling weak, feeling strong or feeling so strong you've hurt others or yourself or whatever, all the Pluto stuff. South node related to family conditioning and conditioned worldview over many lifetimes, kind of how you're plopped into a family system in many lifetimes, uh, whether you're you know, raised by, well, born to and or raised by, because there's no accident when it comes to adoption. It's all the conspiracy of love between souls. Um, related to family conditioned and how you're trained in many lifetimes to see the world. South node ruler by sign, which is related to how you see yourself as an individual in many lifetimes. And North node, of course, related to the South node set of karmas. And this is what you believe is unavailable to you because it's far away from South node conditioning or what you believe you should not pursue or embrace within yourself. So we're going to run through these. I'm going to talk about what it looks like and also talk about uh, how to change it because each of these is a different category. Um, kind of each operates on a different level within our energy fields or psyche or consciousness. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about how to change each of them. And then we're going to have time for examples and questions. I don't want to get too specific with the examples, but we're going to do like categorical things like Karma of Pluto in the seventh versus Pluto in the sixth. Like what beliefs come with that and how to contrast it? Stuff like that. All right. So Pluto karma, Pluto karma includes what we feel we can't do, how and why we may fail or are sure to fail, uh, that we don't have control over our lives. These are all beliefs about these things. Beliefs that we suck <laughs> or that we should hate ourselves. Uh, belief that our deepest pain means we're broken or something is wrong with us, or our anger, you can substitute, substitute anger and a bunch of other Plutonian keywords for pain here, uh, or belief that we can't ever or never get to have or always deserve or never deserve. When you find yourself asking, what's going on here? And you find a voice that says something like, Oh, I never get to have that, or I always deserve. When you find that, that is uh, indicative of the depth of the Pluto business. So just be aware; those kinds of uh, a absolutes are um, are indicate Pluto stuff. Okay. Changing Pluto karma involves deep, intentional emotional work on the shadow parts of the self on difficult emotions and motivations. This is a key point I covered in last month's thing, but I'm gonna, in the Pluto houses thing, to accept that any one of your emotions is actually part of the human experience and that all of them are, is incredibly important for Plutonian empowerment. So you don't fear your anger or your sadness, etc. It's just part of the story, but also motivations. You could do anything. And part of the story with Plutonian empowerment, in my view, uh, this idea of, um, repeat from last time, absolute, unflinching, unashamed self-knowledge, which means the shadow work, followed by absolute, unflinching, unashamed self-acceptance, 
Well, there, your motivations come into play too. We have to accept that we could do anything. And sometimes you are so hurt that you want to lash out. The stinger on the scorpion, right? Goes with this uh, archetype. Okay, so, so deep intentional emotional work, working through these things. Or, or anything that makes you feel disempowered. Uh, weak, not strong, powerless. Every time I use the word weak in these teachings, I cringe a little because I don't like using that word. I don't like thinking of someone as weak or whatever. But, but we do sometimes have parts of us who fear being weak. You know, in a world where the fittest survive or the strongest survive or whatever. So I always uh, kind of uh, pause when I put that word in there. But, but I think for parts of us who have such fears, I think it's important to include it. So changing Pluto karma rests on choosing to become or be strong in the face of what hurts the most, what brings up the most shame, guilt, anger, grief, resentment, depressiveness, hopelessness, blah, 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 or et cetera. So that's the kind of, again, I'm just giving you the overview, but we do really deep work. And I talked last month about the Pluto intensive late October in Sedona. And that, uh, that's what this is for, for six people. Um, okay. So anyway, that again later, but this is how we change Plutonian karma. Now, South node karma is different. It includes beliefs, uh, what you were taught in many lifetimes that the world is like, uh, or should be like. Uh, how the world works, how people should be in the world, uh, what's really important, like what really matters in the world, um, and what kind of person belongs in this family. Because the South Node indicates a worldview, but it is, you know, modeled for you and you receive it through your family when you're born and or raised by a certain group of people. So uh, what kind of person belongs here? Or what kind of person deserves support uh, love and encouragement. Changing South Node karma is in learning to see what is healthy and worth carrying forward from what the font family modeled for you. Owning that they showed you a way of being human that your soul, in fact, asked them to do. Uh, making peace with the family as the, that family as the right one for you and owning what you do well beyond their opinions, as in individuation. You know, that's part of changing South Node karma. Part of it is also, I mean, a huge part of it is also embracing the North Node opportunities or challenges, but a lot of the South Node stuff, it's like, it's like a seesaw where one person's sitting on one end. In your chart, like energetically in your psyche, in your life, that's what the South Node is. You are sitting there. So you are 100% on the ground and the other end is 100% off the ground because the emotional energetic weight of the South node is so strong. The North node is almost not even a, a real thing in our consciousness, except for the crummy beliefs that we'll talk about in a couple of minutes. Uh, if we're changing South node family karma, I mean, it's relative to the whole chart, but I do this thing called the family and the conspiracy of love. It's another four day healing intensive. There'll be another one uh, in uh, 2019. You can keep an eye out for that on my mailing list or Facebook page or whatever. Where we talk about the contracts uh, between, between uh, souls and family. Okay. Now, uh, South node ruler karma. South node ruler is how I believe I should be treated. Uh, what I expect for myself, but what, you know, what opportunities, what I think I should do with my life, who I think I am. South Node Ruler for me, by sign, is this deep layer of identity, be, uh, much deeper than Sun Moon Rising as the personality in this life. So how others see me or should see me, uh, what's available to me in life, what are my options? Okay. Uh, changing South Node Ruler Karma means getting over yourself. Okay, that's kind of a joke. Uh, gaining some objectivity on yourself. <laughs> because remember, this is an identity and you're wearing the costume and reciting all the lines. Oh yes, uh, Tom Jacobs, I'm a teacher, I'm a writer, blah, blah, blah. You know, South Node rulers in the third house, blah, 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 blah. You know, in, in, uh, in Sagittarius, oh, I'm a philosopher, whatever. Uh, I'm just living that story like it's my job. So gaining some objectivity on the self is important. In exploring new options and choices, and what I'm talking about with that is, um, 
you know, every planet, every archetype, every house and sign has many different possibilities. There are only 12 houses. Many parts of life fit in each one. So if you don't like this one or you think you're stuck in this one, well, explore another version of that expression. So exploring new options and choices, getting out of that attachment to this identity is part of changing the South and ruler karma. Now, this involves catching your expectations of how others should treat you and engaging in the moment to find out what they do have to offer and what they might invite you to do. Now, earnestly working to receive reflection from others about who you are and what you bring to the table. What I'm saying is some people will see you as the South Node Ruler version or expression you were in some other lifetime. Some will see who you could be in this one. So some people for me might say, oh, you're a teacher. But others might say some other third house expression. They might say, oh, why don't you write books? You might enjoy writing books. They're seeing my South Node Ruler in the third house. You know, they're seeing that, that energy. So they might offer me options. That's actually a great example because I kind of felt I was a teacher, but I was afraid to write. A lot of self-criticism, fear that the work wouldn't be good and that I'd be embarrassed, whatever. And so that's actually a great example because um, one time a teacher who had written books said to me, when, you publish, when you're holding a copy of your first book, you'll never be the same. And at the time I was like hungry to write a book, but self-conscious and blah, blah, blah. It was true. It was true. So, okay. So don't get uh, seduced into your, by your assumption about who you are and how should people should treat you. That's part of the key. North node karma includes what I believe I should never do because those people do it. <laughs> uh, we all have biases about our North node placement. We have prejudices preformed judgments and it, because it's the opposite of the south node which is what we've been shown in many lifetimes the world is and should be like it's those people i do this in a humorous way with my students and clients all the time um, but there's we'll play with someone in the examples when we talk about nodes changing north node karma is remembering that our south nodes are heavily weighted in our consciousness remember the seesaw idea you're sitting on one end Intentionally branching out and unlearning the old conditioning that it's bad or not worth doing. Like, like if you have a South and an, I, example time, if you have a South and an Aries, you are conditioned to move quickly, to respond to certain things without thinking, maybe to be on the go, be on the edge of your seat, because who knows when a crisis go, is going to occur. And you have to catch that coffee cup before it hits the ground. Like you're on, you're on, you're ready, right? You're primed to go. Well, North and Libra, you haven't in many lifetimes learned to slow down and work with people. Like you're the, you're the solo EMT or paramedic or whatever. And being part of a team a certain way or having a partner to work with where you share responsibilities, that is something you may not have been exposed to in many lifetimes. So you might think that people who can't make their own decisions, uh, that's ridiculous. I, of course I can make my own decision. I instinctively know what I should do. My gut says, yep, go do this, don't do that. So the North Node prejudice about Libra North Node is, or when it's in Libra is, oh, everything's so slow and you gotta wait for other people and what, I have to slow down and, uh, and that's ridiculous, I'm good at what I do. So anyway, all the way around the wheel and all the houses and signs, we have that prejudice with our North Node. We'll, we'll do more of that. Okay, and this is, and also choosing new interpretations of the astrological symbols. I just included three signs here with one stereotypical idea. Leo isn't about being obnoxious, but if you have a south and an Aquarius, part of you might think it must be. Capricorn isn't about being boring, but if you have a south and in Cancer, part of you may think it is. Taurus isn't about being stubborn, but from a Scorpio south node, you, you might wonder if it is. You might have that preconception. Think about the silly stereotypes of every house and sign or every archetype, and we can have those uh, prejudices or biases against it. Yeah. Okay, so for more, I'm just going to give you a, little, a quick list of resources. The Soul's Journey book trilogy. Uh, I do EA classes and tutoring. Uh, the Soul's Journey soundbite database, I don't think I talked about last time, but it's almost 520 minute client readings, where I do, I do Soul's Journey sound bites where I give you an overview of your entire journey in 20 minutes. 
part of you might think this is impossible. It is possible when you're south of rulers in the third house conjunct Mercury uh, in Sagittarius. But anyway, um, condensing all of the major themes in this four-step story. But anyway, I t have taken almost 500 of them and made them a searchable online database so my students and others can learn. So anyway, that is something to check out on my site. I do a monthly subscription service where I, where I uh, lay out the astrology of the month and, and include talking about karma and beliefs and all of that. And then I also have a new website called healingsuicide.com, which has nothing to do with astrology, but it's about soul and its multi-life journey that can help you understand the soul's perspective on human life, how to understand and heal the most intense emotions, which could fit with a lot of these categories that I'm talking about. And then, of course, the Pluto Intensive. I have two spots left open for late October. Be in touch. Uh, join me in Sedona if you want to. I love this graphic because it's about go. It looks like it's going down into something. It's actually a stairwell or the, the column in the middle of a building. Um, but I love that because we're going to descend into Plutonian territory and unearth and heal some things. Okay. So that is, uh, that's the presentation. I want to um, make sure that I, I hope I plan plenty of time. Yeah, about 20 minutes for examples, just random examples and also Q&A. Let's pause for, I mean, I'll pause the examples for a sec and check in with you and see if you have general questions about what I threw at you in this presentation. And then we'll talk about some examples. I don't know if in the chat room is better. I'm not quite sure how you guys typically do this here. That's okay. Just give us a minute to think of a question because um, we do have questions throughout. So just give us a moment. Thank you. Okay, any questions, anyone? I had a quick question on um, the, uh, when, when the rulers, the South Node rulers are retrograde, um, how do you see that? Yeah, I see that as you are probably burned out from doing it or you've done it for reasons that don't serve you or were other people's ideas. So let's say, um, let's say, uh, g give me an example. Can you give me just house and sign example? Um, I have a Scorpio South note and my Pluto is um, retrograde in the first house. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So retrograde in the first house. So you're you show up in many lives as a first house kind of person, you know, creating independence, going your own way, blah blah blah. Uh, in Virgo, right? Because it's, it's with Uranus. It's in, it's with in Virgo. Um, so you're showing up to be responsible and figure out what duty means, and you're going to carry stuff on your shoulders to some degree. You're going to see that the solution is with my willfulness and my power, but it's retrograde. So that means that you might have overdone it in certain lifetimes and you might've been born with a certain level of reticence or resistance to it. Like somebody says, here's how to be of service. Who do in Virgo in the first house? Well, there's all this noble, noble options for you, right? But it burned out. So when I see the South Moon ruler retrograde, I expect the person may be hesitant or like I said, reticent to do it, or might feel that they're making a mistake or they're hesitant to commit to something in that realm. Does that make sense? Yes, yes it does. Yeah, okay. That's how it's it. Um, so person might be might might take a, a number of years or a couple of de few decades to figure out what's worth doing, why, why bother? In that case, first house Virgo, why bother being of service? Yeah, come up with something very, very cool, and others. And they're not primed yet; they're not ready for it, or it's too different. And so then you might say, in some lifetime, "Oh my God, these people don't even know what's good for them. 
I, I, I'm spending decades working this thing out and trying to help them. And they're just sitting there like, you know, cramming bonbons in their mouth and like complaining about how things are wrong. I'm trying to help them change it because that Uranian edge with Pluto is forward looking. So that's my idea. Yeah. Yeah. I have a question. Yeah. Okay. So let's say you have like a conditioning pattern and like the same thing keeps happening, but maybe with a different color wrapping paper on. Right. But it's like yes. the same story. Yes. Okay, then you get really hurt, and then it's like, and if your North Node is there with Pluto and Venus or something like that, you are going to be like, okay, after X amount of what, you almost feel like, it's like, you know, I, I mean, I just don't know how to clear that because it's such a trauma imprint. After yeah. a while, once things keep repeating, that I don't really know how you know, unless a miracle happens, it's really yep. difficult to try it again and again and again. Okay. So did, did you say like with planets conjunct the North node? Is that what you're, yeah. that, yeah. okay. Okay. So my view on planets conjunct the North node is that you haven't experienced Pluto. in a bunch of life. To, <laughs> Pluto. Okay, great. Pluto. So Pluto is the thing I, I view that we have to, that's most important for the person to do to make life feel meaningful. But any planet conjunct the North node says all the, families I'm born into in many lifetimes agreed not to show me healthy versions of it because I need to grow into it. The North node is far away from my family and what they taught me. Right. So Plutonian strength, the ability to look at something in the eye, the ability to face anger, process grief, like be willing to hold space for these intense emotions. So what that is probably, what's probably happening is, unconscious in the uh, i'm doing this unconsciously right down deep down there's a belief that part of you may say i'm powerless against this thing that keeps happening so it's vibrating it keeps coming to you so here's my suggestion hmm. you look at what you okay you acknowledge what's happening i'm not saying ignore that but you also, when you have a, space, a chance to be objective, a little more objective, listen to the parts of you who are triggered and ask them, ask yourself, what kind of person has to go through this? Who, deser <laughs> who, who deserves this? Why do I deserve this? Go down a list of questions like that. And you will hear yourself, that voice in, that's always been in your head, say, oh, people who are losers or whatever they say, people who don't deserve love, whatever it is. Uh -huh. That is the content of the unconscious belief. Well, I just think I just get angry that it keeps happening and so I don't even yes. want to so I don't even want That's to right. try anymore. I'm just like done. That's I understand. It. I understand you. Uh, believe me. <laughs> and yet if you want to change it, that's how you can change it. So it's like this. Um, but are you saying I could change it alone? Don't I need the other players to help change it? I mean, I need another what player. Are, what other players? You know, like, okay, so we're all in this play together. So, yeah. like, somebody does reaction and treats you some way and then you react. But if, like, let's say the dust settles and you're saying we have to fix it, we have to try this opportunity. But what yeah. if there even aren't any more opportunities? Well, that's why you work with what you believe it means that it happened so often. Or so many times. Well, I have it's no clue. I mean, I have no clue. Well, what does it seem to mean about you that it kept happening? I, I think I was just reiterating maybe something that was missing when I was younger. There you go. So then you look at the, the, the situation from when you were younger and you say, what does that kid believe? What did I feel when I was younger? What did it seem to mean about me that I didn't get love or didn't get support or did get hurt, whatever the deal is. Mm -hmm. And you listen to that kid because she will tell you, and I promise you it's a manifestation, her experience, your experience as a child, her experience, your experience is a manifestation of a multi-life problem. So unconscious parts vibrated you as a child into experiencing these things. So you don't need to deal with that family member or those family members. You don't need to deal with those relationship partners from over the years. Mm -hmm. It's about your, only about your perception about why the things happened. I mentioned earlier the girlfriend thing. Pluto and Libra conjunct Venus in the 12th. I, Pluto and Libra conjunct Venus in the 12th, yeah. 
I'm going to experience loss in relationship. Some of it's, you know, family members. I don't know how to grieve or my favorite cat when I was a kid, you know, but it's also going to be periodically somebody saying to me, I love you. I can never talk to you again. Just doesn't <laughs> serve me anymore. I have to leave you or start projecting on me. Uh, you're terrible. You ruined my life, whatever. Right. Or a friend who just cuts me off. Now I have intense reactions to all of these things, but my job stepping into the driver's seat to try to understand these things from a bird's eye view and being more responsible about, about understanding my unconscious vibrations are creating this. Okay. Let me ask myself in that pain, what does it seem to mean that I got rejected? What does it seem to mean about her, about me, about life, about love, whatever it is. And I can write down and track what the beliefs are. So you kind of reverse engineering what the problem is by letting the triggered part of you talk. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think you said a magic thing, like I'm re, like taking up where I left off in another life, perhaps, and now it's happening. But like, I can't understand why this would happen to a little girl. Or like, I mean, right. I, I just well, so it, it happened. Whatever it is, it happened to a little girl because it happened to a person in some lifetime, and that wound is still there. Here's the deal with Pluto crap, just for everybody. I mentioned this last month, but it bears repeating every time I come on here. We often. I would say many people. I had one student slash client over the years who has said that I don't think that happened to me. But when we look at the chart and we discern what is the worst possible thing this Pluto represents, what's the worst idea? <laughs> um, we're born fully formed, vibrating pain for many lifetimes. So the little kid often has it walk up to him or her. The kid can't deal with it. So in other words, some of the worst case Plutonian crap happens to us before we're five or six years old, sometimes mm -hmm. infants. So, right. so it's not that you, again, take this teaching in, in stride. It's not that you deserved it. Unconsciously, it's an unresolved pain from many lifetimes. So it manifested in front of you because here's the deal. I didn't say this in this presentation. It's not in the natural order of things for how our consciousness is and how we are wired to have pain. So things bubble up and then people walk up and say, oh, I'm going to hurt you. But they're dovetailing into our karmic problem. Like I, like I said, whenever you get into anyone's chart, like for you, it's a whole universe of self-understanding you've been working with, you're trying to get through. You know, it's really complicated for each person, but it can, the karma, the belief wrapped around the emotion can be changed. In my deal with rejection, what do I think it means? Well, I have to listen to that and then change my mind about that. And then if it happens again, this is the key point, I get to not decide it means that same thing again. So let's say somebody dumps me and says, you know what? I just can't be friends with you. I really just suddenly, I hate you, whatever. Uh, it's going to hurt. I'm not denying that it would or should, or I'm not saying it shouldn't, but I can change my mind about what it means. That starts to change the karma. It doesn't mean I'm a loser. It doesn't mean I'm a jerk. It doesn't mean I'm not lovable. It doesn't mean I'm not attractive. It doesn't mean any of those things. But those are the parts that will come forward and talk. That's so a great is, point, Tom. Thank you. We have uh, Carolyn with a question. Great, Carolyn. Thank you. Yeah. Tom, um, I'd like to say that a year ago, um, I recovered some unconscious memories, and I've cleared so much and I understand my part but I would just like to hear you talk about um, Pluto in the fourth square Mars in the seventh generally yeah. I think I've yes. dealt with it. I've you know I've lived alone for three years now four years retired and um, oh god I look old I, I am old <laughs> oh, good. oh good we're all aging together it's all good come on yeah yeah. Um, but it's it's such this last year has been such a gift of revelation of ad, admitting mm -hmm. admitting is the wrong word, but my part yes. in whatever this is. That's right. Re released me 
I'm getting, I'm 70 in October okay. and my memory's getting better because I'm not using all this energy to why is this happening? Poor me, victim me. Yes. But good, good for you. What what is the the Pluto Mars square yeah. thing, particularly four seven? Yeah, I'm smiling because um, in my advanced evolutionary astrology classes, this has been coming up over and over again. I put out a call for volunteer guinea pigs so I could do a reading for my students and have them listen, right? And then they can ask us questions. It's like a laboratory thing. Out of the seven people so far, I think um, five or six had Mars square Pluto natally. <laughs> different, different signs, houses, different generations, different ages. And now the one this week has Mars opposite Pluto. So this conversation about Mars Pluto stuff has been evolving. So, so Pluto for me, you know, Pluto in the fourth, what you have to do that's most important is develop a foundation, create sec inner security for yourself, learn about belonging, which can involve not belonging or having to remove yourself, that, all that bit. Squares to Pluto for me say, I'm learning through tension about this other energy. Like when I do my nesting thing, I may draw, you will draw, but I try not to be too deterministic and fatalistic about it. You will draw Mars people, seventh house types, friends, lovers, spouses, mates, whatever, who say to you, not that foundation, don't do it that way. Yes. Or they say, um, that'll never make you safe. Here, do this instead. But you're trying to nest right? And they're pushing or pulling. So you and a bunch of lifetimes are learning about saying yes and no through people who may be pushy. Yeah. Now that's a nice way to say it because sometimes they, they're going to be abusive. That's, that's what we've been getting into in my advanced class because I'm telling my students assume the worst, but when you're working with a client, don't say that it has to have happened because it can be arguments it can be just pressure and expectations from others. But that's kind of how I see it. It's like you're trying to nest and create this stability and you're drawing fiery or pushy or aggressive, passive aggressive even, but you're drawing those people to you from the soul's yep. point of view. It is to teach you how to say yes and no. So you can trust yourself to create the foundation the way you need to. Cause if somebody says to you, Carol, when you're doing it wrong, you have the option of, inquiring within am i doing it wrong and then you get to develop more self-trust and say actually i'm not doing it wrong thanks for your input i'm going to do it this way and if somebody says i'm going to strong arm you into doing it my way you say next get out that's what your soul wants you to learn but yeah. you and every other human who might have mars square pluto may be dealing with this whole cache of difficult memories when somebody said you're going to do it you have to, or somebody grab your shoulders, literally, physically, right? Or somebody hurt you deeply, physically and or emotionally, psychologically, sexually, any of it. So, so people with Mars square Pluto are dealing with some version of this where somebody comes up, the, the intense person, the person with anger is a lot of times Mars squaring us. Their anger, they're trying to control themselves. They don't know how to control us. We won't be controlled, conflict. But, but we're dealing with, when we have that kind of signature, we're dealing with the painful memories, the residues of abuse and trauma. So I say to you, your soul wants you to say yes and no. But yet I want to acknowledge it's a lot deeper than that. But we don't have to say yes and no, but I understand the experiences can go much deeper. That's what I want to say. I was I was also told that for a lot of my life I was borderline psychotic mm. and that through um, Jason Holly dealing with the Arcadian myth a year ago I that's when the memories came up of the childhood abuse. that's right repressing yeah. abuse make you nuts and I wasn't but I wasn't ready until right. now that's right if I would have, the container wasn't strong enough. The container's strong. And in the That's last right. two weeks, I've been getting downloads of such great happiness. Just yeah. happiness. Well, that's real, too. It's just yeah. if we feel oh, under, we you know, under this pile of boxes with a bunch of knives sticking out of the boxes, and we're like, ah, you know, and we're trying to, like, manage this weight 
of painful memory that we're trying to repress or, you know, it takes a tremendous amount of energy to keep something out of conscious awareness. I steal that from Steve Forrest. The idea of the Pluto thing. You get your power when you face the pain. Yes. You get your power back. So that sounds like the groove that you are currently in. So good for you. I'm happy to hear that. Thank really you, happy. Tom. I've learned so much from you. Great. Okay. Thank you. Good. Okay. Any final questions? Tom, did you want to go to some example charts that you had? Well, not charts, just briefly certain examples. Sure, like go just, for it. We've got five minutes. Yeah. So, okay, yeah. great. Let's, let's do that. So um, we talked earlier, Wanda was asking, I think it was Wanda, about Pluto in the first house, this idea of, um, you know, responsibility falls on my shoulders, especially in Virgo. Um, some of the karma is I can't say no. The beliefs may be I can't say no right? They need me, or this job needs doing, or the thing is broken. Of course I have to do it. And uh, so that's like one example where the belief is super strong, that can drive us. Now, to contrast that, a south node in the first house in Virgo, let's just use the same, the same symbol here. You're going to be conditioned in many lifetimes. You're going to be born into family systems that exhibit or model this energy, this, this importance of responsibility and independence and maybe the importance of things falling you know on your shoulders or you taking responsibility for things being duty bound or obligated to be a leader or something like that to be always that person who organizes things and stays after to clean up that's a virgo problem sometimes um so the belief would be well yeah i mean everybody does that right you, you know if south node is in virgo on the first you're going to assume the world is like that well, people are responsible, aren't they? And then you find out they're not. Or they're not always, or not the way you expect. Uh, South Node ruler in Virgo in the first, regardless of where South Node may be, you would take it as your job. Now with Pluto, it's ups and downs. Pluto, it's the weight, the heaviness, the because the Pluto or stakes with Pluto regarding creation and destruction are so high, you know, it's like could be the best thing ever if we do it. And if it doesn't work well, it could be the worst thing ever. That's what I mean. The stakes are very high. But the, but the South Node ruler is like, I am a Virgo first house person. So I'm going to do the job. I'm going to show up. So that's just a little bit of contrast. Um, I want to give you some other ideas. Like, uh, like I have my South Node in the 10th house. And I found myself annoyingly was doing, like carrying some boxes with my girlfriend out in the heat. And I was like, annoyingly, I was annoying myself, worried that my hair wouldn't look good on this presentation, south end of the 10th house. Because I think the world is about appearances, right? Um, uh, some other examples. Uh, why, don't, why don't you guys just feed me a couple of quick, not your chart and the whole configuration, but just like a random example that you might be interested in for a minute. Give me just a couple. Okay, how about Pluto and futility? Okay, well, that could be for all Plutos. I was thinking about houses or signs or something, but, but yeah, the, the futility of Pluto. Um, because the stakes are very high and Pluto does involve survival issues, kind of like Darwinian processes, you know, of survival of the fittest uh, and survival issues, um, we can have memories of many lifetimes attached to beliefs. I didn't try, like, like, let's say that somebody died of starvation in some life thousands of years ago, which we all have. Um, the, the, you might believe there's no point in trying. That would be kind of the futility idea. Also like to get more specific, uh, Pluto and Virgo, I talked about the idea of like not getting through to somebody you're trying to help. Uh, you know, Pluto and Leo, nobody's listening to you. Nobody can hear your creativity or acknowledge you, so you might give up and, be, and feel futility. In Libra, nobody's helping you, you might give up. So we have these memories of, of, of many lifetimes when the worst happened with Pluto, the absolute worst. I have a whole teaching on um, creating meaning for ourselves, and uh, it relates back to um, uh, the philosopher Albert Camus and the existentialists. And this idea of like Sisyphus pushing the boulder up the hill, he writes this essay called uh, The Myth of Sisyphus. And it's about how if whatever you're doing, if you put yourself into it, you can create a sense of purposefulness and meaningfulness. So there is a way out of that Pluto, Plutonian futility. But yeah, we all potentially have that 
whatever our our thing, you know, whatever our Pluto placements are. And that we have to cycle through that, which means cycling through hopelessness and despair and meaninglessness. But everything I promise you, everything can be healed. Yes. But the parts of you don't know that and they disagree vehemently because they don't know how to deal with the pain that you're feeling. Beautiful. Great. This Thank has you. been so helpful. Thank you so much. Thank you for the opportunity, Linda. Thank Looking you. Looking forward to your next meeting. Would you all please thank Tom Jones, everyone? Thank you. Thank Welcome. you, Sean. Excellent. My pleasure. Thank awesome. You. Thank you, Tom. Welcome. Bye -bye. All right. Bye, everybody. Thank you.